This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. In this month's featured article in the Heart Rhythm Journal, we are celebrating the success of the Venus trial and looking at a sub-study with first author Adila Dorr from Houston Methodists and director of electrophysiology, Miguel Valdorbano. Welcome, Adi and Miguel. So to kick this off, Adi, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the rationale as to why we need to do a sub-study of Venus, which is really a paradigm shift of finally finding some ancillary or adjunctive approach to adding to PVI for persistent AFib. Yeah, so the Venus uh, trial showed a very good success in the, uh, in the outcome of the group of the uh, uh, Venus alcohol ablation. And we want to understand what are the factors that can influence uh, this success. Uh, we focused, we, first we kind of uh, scan all the factors, uh, uh, but we mainly focused on the mechanism. And uh, uh, we were looking at the mitral flutter specifically, uh, as we know the anatomy of, um, of the VOM, exactly where it is, and the triggers that come from the vein of Marshall. Uh, so that was one of them. And, uh, uh, and the other thing that we wanted kind of to explore is the, um, the operator uh, experience part as well. Maybe if you have a little bit more experience then the technique is better, uh, you can ex execute the technique better. So um, yeah, basically that's where. So let's take those separately. Let's talk about operator experience and then we'll talk about achieving mitral block. Can you tell us a little bit about how mitral block was defined? in this study in the protocol? So mitral block defined, uh, I mean, the operator defined if he, at the end of the procedure, if he had mitral block or not, it was operator based. Uh, and it was by the differential, uh, differential pacing from whatever he has. I mean, we are doing it from appendage and live wire and, uh, but it depends on. And how frequently do you need to do adjunctive RF to be able to achieve mitral block versus just have it intrinsically after vein of martial alcohol? So basically, uh, our technique is doing it always. I mean, we are doing we are giving the uh, vein of martial uh, we are giving the alcohol in the VOM and then we add the uh, posterior mitral flutter um, line. Sorry, uh, kind of routinely for everyone. Um, so I think. Most of them did that as well. Perfect. And then confirm the, the block. Miguel, for those that are now tuning in and finally literally drinking the Kool-Aid, the alcohol, and are now wanting to do this, tell us a little bit about the difficulties because clearly operator experience mattered. And for it's those that were doing less than 20, more than 20, there's a kind of a cutoff. When do you struggle? What are the struggles that you see with inability to achieve the outcome? So the, the, the hardest thing is to, to get used to understanding the, um, the variations in anatomy, the venal marshal. Um, you know, we all have seen, when we started this, we all had seen venal marshal uh, when we were doing uh, coronary centrogenograms for left replacement. But once you start systematically trying to engage uh, an angioplasty wire and balloon in the venal marshal, you realize the anatomy is very variable. Uh, from you know the distance from the ostium of the CS to the vein of Marshall can be extremely variable. Um, the only thing that's fixed is that when there's a valve of usance, the, the vein of Marshall is there, but but the variability is huge. And and to be honest, in many of this at, at the beginning, many of the patients we started at the beginning, we probably injected alcohol in an appendage vein uh, or in other veins that were not really vein of Marshall. Um, <laughs> That, that has been actually, the same experience was reproduced by the Bordeaux group that had similar experiences where they had uh, given alcohol in veins that then in retrospect, they found out that they were not in a martial. The, the issue is be patient, understand the anatomy, pick up good projections on, on fluoroscopy that, that show it. So you wanna do an RAO, usually do a shallow RAO to see that the venous martial is posterior and LAO to see that it's, that it's uh, going upward relative to the CS. And, and then you have to be a little bit, a little bit used to uh, the materials you're working with. So angioplasty wires and balloons, many, many EPs don't have enough familiarity and you need to get used to that. Uh, sometimes it helps to get interventional cardiologists to help you the first few cases. But I think that once you, once you make the investment in, in committing to 
getting it done and, and putting the time, it becomes completely routine. And in the cases that it's not doable, it becomes immediately obvious that it's not doable and you give up and you don't waste time. So Adi, the, the figure you've supplied is great. It's really the central illustration showing you the differences between the outcomes when you have true mitra block and for those that can't achieve it. Can you just take us through those curves and the central message there? Yeah, so th this slide is either more than that, it's the combination of the perimetral block and high volume center. And the high volume center is uh, like uh, more than I think 20 procedures uh, uh, experience. And you see that there is a big difference in the recurrence of uh, AFib or ATAC or flutter. Uh, in the group uh, that had catheter ablation uh, versus the, the, the group that had VOM. Uh, with a the hazard ratio was 0.47, which is a lot. So we kind of combined the uh, two subgroups together. That's great. So it's safe to say for our, our viewers and learners that a lot of the success here is predicated upon achievement of mitral block. So Miguel, yeah. You're a mechanism guy. We talk about this all the time. What does this mean for mechanism? Does that mean you need mitral block and paric in, in paroxysmal as well? Now, Venus is really persistent patients. Is it really that a line of block mitigates the risk for AFib rotors or something meandering through? Or is this, you know, is this trigger elimination? So let's just admit from the beginning that we're all going to be throwing out hypotheses, right? Because we have no proof. But um, the what I think, honestly, is that achieving perimetral block is a marker of a greater, more solid ablation in that region. Um, sure, if you achieve perimetral block, you're going to prevent perimetral flutter. But we also showed that we prevented recurrence of atrial fibrillation. It was not just elimination of perimetral flutter as a form of recurrence. It was all recurrences were, prevent were more prevented when you have perimetral block. So I think non-specifically, it's a marker of a greater extent or a, or a more solid ablation by alcohol, uh, plus minus whatever radio frequency is required to get blocked. Um, there may be more associated innervation that gets that gets uh, abolished uh, with ablation when you get perimetral block. In general, I think it just is a marker of perhaps a venal marshal that had more tissue reach because of its capillary network associated. Um, and a more solid, more uh, more transmural ablation than in those cases where the venous muscle might have been too small or, or too small a lesion or too, too small a uh, um, network of capillaries associated with it to create enough of a lesion to lead to pain mitral block. So honestly, it's just a marker of a more extensive ablation. Sure, that what you're trying to do, you actually achieve, which is yeah. really nice. And it may also be that you're eliminating some of the reconnection gaps on the ridge for the left-sided veins as well. So a final thought, how do you believe alcohol is going to change the world? And what about in the world of electroporation? Do you see this going to be tied hand in hand? Do you believe that the ridge may be easily eliminated with pulse field? You know, I, I still have to see the, the electroporation data confirmed uh, and really solid. I, I have troubles with the idea of a single catheter position achieving PV isolation. I think we've burned, we've been burned many times uh, with that concept. Uh, but uh, it, just like electroporation, alcohol seems to have a durable ablation. There's a study from Bordeaux showing that uh, patients were studied after ablation and, and the vast majority had intact scar in the venous marshal area. So uh, in terms of durability, it does, it will, it, will, it will compete at least with what we hear about electroporation. And in terms of the location, I think I have not seen any, any data from electroporation sites uh, talking about bay mitral block. And that is something that um, you know, we know in the, in, the venal, in the pulmonary veins, electroporation seems to work beautifully. And just yesterday, I think there was a paper in Heart Rhythm by Vivek Reddy showing that the, the PVs remain isolated very nicely chronically. So um, if we achieve the same thing in the mitral isthmus, then it's, it's a very nice opportunity for synergistic um, effects combining both technologies. Well, Miguel, I want to congratulate you for really bringing a new way to ablate for those inaccessible areas and really introducing and pushing forward, you know, venous alcohol chemical ablation. And I want to congratulate, congratulate Adi Lador for a fantastic paper that is really 
an extension of a paradigm shift and that you're a new faculty at Houston Methodist. Um, so I want to congratulate you for the, both you. of those, Adi. And congrats to the Thank whole you. team over there in Houston. Thank you very much for the time. Miguel, I love the mustache. And Thank we'll you. see you soon. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye.